Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Radio Mythalverse, official podcast for the Mythalverse. As always, your hosts are Brett McGowan, writer, creator of Changeland and Urban Fairy Tale, and head of public relations and community outreach. And my partner, our co owner, head writer, and writer, creator of Mythics, Matt Trin. Hey, guys. How's it going? And sitting in with us today, our special guest and one of our other talents. Say hi to Duskwill. Aw, I'm a talent. Yeah. Hello, Dusk- I'm Duskwill. I would be a writer if I could keep an artist for more than a couple of weeks. That is a bit of a downer, but whatever, we'll roll with it. Anyway, this week's episode, when this uh, goes live, it'll be the day after Thanksgiving. Matt and I kind of thought it'd be a good time to talk about Mystery Science Theater. That might seem weird to everyone when who doesn't know, because what does a show about a bunch of puppets making fun of bad movies have to do with Thanksgiving? It has everything to do with their Turkey Day special, where they have a marathon of MST3K episodes all day. Which has been a tradition since their days on Comedy Central and Actually, I think I came across a video where Joel, the the original host, he I think he said something to the effect of that the first episode of MST3K aired on a Thanksgiving. Which makes it really an anniversary. So to open up, we'll talk about our history with Mystery Science Theater. Since Dusk is the newest person on the show, you're going to go first. Oh, well, my experiences with mystery science theater isn't really that much of a deep one like i knew they were a thing for like years years but the furthest extent i've ever watched was a couple of episodes one of them i believe was a gamera movie i i'm pretty sure it was one of the gamera movies they've watched i watched them do i can't remember what the other one is but outside of that, I've watched mostly clips of, like, jokes and, like, compilations of running gags, mostly. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I guess, like, out of what you have seen, Joel or Mike, who was the better host? Oh, man, that is a good question. <laughs> yeah. That's a... Mm. This is a question mm-hmm. that divides the the MST3K fan base down the middle. <laughs> uh, honestly, I would not be surprised. Both are really, they're both really good though. I don't think I really have enough experience to really make that call. Which which one was it? Did the gamble? That I think was from. I Joel's think it was. Era. Yeah. Yeah, the Gamera, I'm pretty sure all the Gamera movies were in Joel's era. I don't remember Mike doing, the closest Mike ever came to doing a giant monster movie, I think, was Gorgo. Well, Mike was a writer for the show. That is before true. Before he became host. That is true, yeah. Yeah. yeah the yeah. way he describes it, the way he describes it is, he started off as the guy who would take who would just break down the jokes for him. He all sit in the office. He was told to make jokes when he, whenever he felt like it. Found out he was actually funny, and then made him a murder. And then eventually became head writer. Yeah, funny story is how they found Mike. I think he he was a he was a local local talent in the stand up scene and uh, was either. I can't remember if it was Wisconsin or Minnesota. I know it was in the Midwest that much, I can say for certain. Because yeah. pretty much all the, pretty much the entire, entire, entire staff and crew are from the Midwest. Yeah, I th- I'm pretty sure it's Minnesota. Yeah. And I think he was doing a bit where he was sort of doing an impression of Robert Frost, which... Very gutsy for a stand-up comedian. The guy basically, had, I, depending on the he, I what he's working on, 
has no actual. He he ha, uh, he has no boundaries in where he'd go basically. <laughs> So, I mean, okay, so now that we've heard from Dusk, what's your history with MST3K, Matt? Basically, you watched it on Sci Fi Channel first, since it was the Mike era. And it was also the time when Bill Corbett took over as Crow. Mm -hmm. Trying to remember which episode it was. But. I can think it might have. What? Can you say whether or not you got hooked on it immediately, or did it take a little while before it clicked with you? Uh, I got hooked on it. Well, I'd say that after finally watching, after taking time to watch the Comedy Central seasons, I think those are better than the than the. Sci-Fi Channel, mainly because of the nature of MST3K and how them keeping the episodes depends on the on if they can keep the the copyright for it, because there are large gaps in the Sci-Fi Channel era that you cannot watch anymore, and since Sci-Fi Channel demanded at them, that they had a storyline, you'll, you'll often be confused by what's going on afterwards. Pretty sure even back when that wasn't an issue, it could still get confusing in places during reruns. Yeah, I mean, Mike blowing up three planets, I think most of those were cut out because of the rights issues, as well as him going on trial for it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I think, like, a lot of these luckily have been preserved by people who recorded them. Oh, yeah. But it's not the same as, like, an official release. It is. No, I think. It, it is possible. It's possible to fill the gaps in, but you are not going to get the best quality footage for it. <laughs> It uh, depends because some of these, uh, some people, some YouTubers are quite capable at upscaling and cleaning up the uh, footage. In my experience, it's a, it's always kind of a little bit of a crapshoot with when you're dealing with an IP as niche as Mystery Science Theater. Yeah, well, I think the big reason why they haven't been taken down is because. MST3K, the creators of the show, really want to... They like their fans. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they definitely do. As far as my history goes, I kind of got exposed to it through osmosis through the ch through Channel Awesome people. Primar oh, yeah. Primarily Spoony. He talked, a, he talked a lot about how much they were an influence on... On his content, especially how when his original idea for what the Spoonie experiment was supposed to be was basically him doing a version of Mystery Science Theater. And I think Doug made a lot of references to Mystery oh, yeah. Science as well. Oh yeah, Doug did too. But yeah, Sp but yeah, Spoonie was like kind of my main vector for it. I think Mike Nelson had had given the Salsa Critic a positive review as well. So, like, that was kind of how I first got exposed to what Mystery Science Theater was. I never actually got around to watching an episode for years until I watched SF Debris' retrospective on the whole show, mainly covering Channel Awesome to, I mean, mainly covering Comedy Central to Sci-Fi. Yeah, no, he didn't do anything for the Netflix season, which we're not going to really talk about because... Well, we don't need to. Well, it's still MSTK, but there's noticeable differences with the Netflix series in that it seems like Netflix had more control than the people that 
understood and actually understood so. Yeah. Because a lot of the jokes they have in the Netflix seasons are pretty mean. Mm-hmm. And this is... Mm-hmm. Everyone says that the se- uh, seasons after Netflix were the better ones with Jonah. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, what I kind of... I was kind of fascinated to learn about like what it was like behind the scenes through SF Debris' retrospective. And that sort of kind of spurred me on to start kind of watching Gene episodes. I sort of would... It was either watch them or I just left them on in the background while I slept. And they were a really good sleep aid for me. Not because they were boring. It just kind of helped. Just, you know, really helped. Well, the movies were boring. A lot of them are, yeah, but it's just not... It's just that, you know, it was just really good background noise to fall asleep to. And I really be... And I really grew an affection for the Joel era. I do, like nothing against Mike, but if you ask, if you're gonna ask me point blank, most of my favorite episodes are Joel's. But Mike was really good. Like, I mean, the fact that he even had had Joel's blessing to take over the show from him, I think, says everything. Funny thing is that Joel actually fought to have Mike as the host because they were going to. Hi, I do auditions uh, for the new host. Mm-hmm. I bet he did. Uh, hearing that puts to rest any kind of notion that Joel and Mike hate each other. I would love to know where that comes from. Fans. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, the thing with Joel is that I think what I really kind of enjoyed about him was just all those, was the invention exchanges, just because. Joel had a background with prop comedy and special effects, and he was, he was, he's a very underrated talent in it. Like, honestly, this guy was good enough that he could have been working on major Hollywood productions. But instead, he went to go make what became MST3K for a local station in Minnesota, and then later he went to go work for a toy company after he left. So it's like... He also did, uh, I started, uh, I tried to start up some other shows, such as, he tried to start a show on Comedy Central called The Xbox. The what? The Xbox. Basically, it, it died in pre-production, but I, I enjoy the fact that he actually tried to start a show called The Xbox. I'm going to have to process this was, that. I need to process this that. This was years before Microsoft started their, their console. I, like, I'm 99% sure it's a coincidence that they have the same name, but it's like... It's like, what were the odds? Staggering. <laughs> like, I do not know what to think of that. But I mean, like a, but I mean, like a lot of the thing, a lot of things that we kind of associate with what became part of MST3K's identity, like that was a lot of Joel, just because of the sensibilities he brought uh, from his like prop comedy and his special effects wizardry, like, and I mean, like the guy was really fucking talented. Well, I can't say was because he's still alive. The guy is fucking talented. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Trying to jump the gun there with the past tense. <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, 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 no, no. Joel's still alive. So I, 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 I know it's been a rough ten years with celebrity deaths, but let, let, let's not get ahead of ourselves here. Yeah, I know. Like, look, yeah. Joel, Joel is still alive, so we refer to him in the present tense. He's uh, he also hosted some new MST three K episodes too. Yeah, he did. Um, yeah, <clears throat> and we're also kind of happy to say that the. Turkey Day marathons are still a staple on their official YouTube channel. It's just a, I mean, yeah, it's a live stream and it's just random episodes they they throw up on there for about twenty four hours. But hey, it still goes. Yeah, especially when they don't have a channel a network to go by anymore. I don't think it's really much of a secret that the, the all three of us missed out on the Comedy Central 
Troll era, but because uh, there are some interesting things that went on during that era. Not necessarily what was going on with the show, but what Comedy Central was doing to the show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I, th- I think one of the most infamous things had to be when during the credit roll, they would have an audio clip of Penn Jillette uh, playing over it, announcing the next episode of... Would this be... Uh, would it have... I'm trying to remember, did Penn and Teller have a show before Bullshit? I think they, they did. They had a couple. I know they did the stage show. Uh, was it uh, Can You Fool Us or something like that? That might be it. Yeah, the... It, was that the show where they had where they brought on people to do like magic tricks? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. one. And they had to like guess how they did it, and if they could figure out, they won like a cash prize or something. Mm-hmm. And because Penn and Teller are professional magicians, it was very difficult to fool them. I mean, obviously, the guys know most of the tricks in the book. Oh yeah, they definitely do. Yeah, and if it. Yeah, this would have been like the this would have been in during the '90s. So, and I think bullshit aired during like that was what early 2000s. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds about. Yeah. Well, it was it what was, a, I remember it being fairly recent yeah. compared to the '90s. Yeah, it's whatever show they had on Comedy Central before bullshit. But yeah, like a lot of but a lot of mystery science theater fans kind of found that a little bit annoying. That you know, just having Penn Teller's, I mean Penn Jillette's voice playing over, over the credits. And this could have, something like this could especially be annoying. Like during that one particular episode where, because they had because the movie they did was too short, they had to essentially come up with a filler gag of the credit button malfunctioning. I mean, just to fill out the airtime. So, you had Penn talking over Frank struggling to get at the credit roll to work properly. Yeah, you can definitely see where, how people could get annoyed by that. <laughs> yeah, that was actually a problem they, they would run into with a lot of movies they covered. A lot of them were pretty short, so they would have to fill out airtime time with shorts like one of the most one of the most legendary one was Mr. B Natural if you guys have not seen that one you really need you are doing yourself a disservice because it's just like it has so it like that one became the benchmark for how they cut for how they did how they covered like anything like whether it was a movie or a short because I think like that was like around the hour where they really started nailing their stride when it came to the humor. Now, like, they were sort of figuring this out during the first season, and actually, fun fact, they're not very fond of the first season. They actually regard it as more of a learning experience than a proper show. I feel like with a lot of creatives, they will always look the harshest on their earliest works. Yeah. Yeah, that is true, but it's like, the the first season, and I'm not even talking about the KCMA stuff, I'm talking about like the first season they did with Comedy Central. Mm-hmm. Like, the KCMA show was, the KCMA show, it looked like basic cable. It's exactly what you'd expect. It's about as cheap. Well, it is basic cable. Yeah, it's about as cheap looking as you could imagine it would be. Whereas the first season of Comedy Central was something more was something that was probably closer to what to most major cable packages. Like it, you know, it was a little bit more presentable. It still had a cheap and sort of kitschy look to it, but that was kind of part of the identity. The thing that they kind of struggled with, though, was sort of like thing things that we that we took for ended up taking for granted as the show went on. Mostly the presentation. If you watch the first season, like once they get to the film segments. You kind of notice that their silhouettes sort of have a green tint to it, and that was because they hadn't figured out how to properly process the film so that the contrast was right. 
as someone did eventually at least show them how to do it correctly and that and from season two onward it had the more iconic look that we're familiar with when it, with the silhouettes. And not only that, like, they kind of initially went in wanting to do mainly impro improvised jokes. But uh, the one of the one of the people, uh, the actor for Doctor Doctor Earhart, I think. Yeah. Yeah. The first sidekick before Frank, Hank for Doctor Forrester. Like the act, the actor for him, he said that, you know, improv is good and all, but we should also probably keep a keep a few pre written jokes in the back just so we can maintain something, maintain some kind of structure. And he was seventeen at the time as well. <laughs> yep. Oh yeah, but yeah. I mean, he was right, ultimately, because... Yeah. And I think it was also... I think they also went in wanting to do, like, a lot more than just riffing on the movie. They wanted to do more skits and everything. Like, they they had, like, a... They had, like, a this really huge vision for what the show was going to be like. But they realized that riffing on the movies was where they were strongest, and that's what they should stick to. And, and it worked. Yeah. Yeah, and so like season two is kind of like the season two would I would say is pretty much the best place to start if you're just getting in, especially when Tom Servo's voice changes in between seasons, and it's a very noticeable change. Yeah, when Kevin Murphy takes over, I for yeah, because like uh, the person. The person who originally did Tom's voice was the actor for Earhart, but then he left the show after season one. And so they had to replace him with Kevin Murphy, who honestly did a much better job with uh, with Tom. Like, he kind of gave Tom um, the personality we love. Yeah, that personality remained with you know, with Rip Rex as well. Mm-hmm. Do you remember which season Frank comes in? Season two. Uh, and yeah, were... he came in. He came in pretty early. Yeah, they wasted none. Yeah, Frank was like Frank's one of the few like outsiders as far as the crew goes because like, as I said earlier, most of, if not all, the cast and crew is from the Midwest, whereas Frank got his start in New York. So. And they wanted to, and Comedy Central wanted them to shoot the show in New York. Yeah, but which no. was a, a disaster. Yeah, like, you know, I don't know how they managed to keep it in Minnesota, but I'm glad they did. But yeah, yeah, so their schedule. <laughs> like Frank was a really good presence on that show, just because, like I said, like Frank had a background in stand up. Up, he was just naturally a funny person, and he yeah. he played off so well as being like he the sidekick to Doctor Forrester. He, just... he was also the one that picked the movies as well, such as we would not know of Man Off the Hands of Fate if it wasn't for him. <laughs> fun fact. It's... Here's a fun fact. For Frank's final episode, they did Samson versus the versus the Vampires, which is an English dub of a Mexican wrestling movie, and Frank Conniff is a huge fan of wrestling Mexican movies. He's also apologized for, for discovering Man Off the Hands of Fate. I mean, I really have a hard time understanding why that's a bad thing, because that's one of the best episodes of the entire show. All the sequels. <laughs> All the cheap sequels that they made for Man of the Hands of Fate and <laughs> the game. They made a game. Yes. Like, I can't help but... A I don't... You know what? I'm just gonna say it. Frank is absolutely wrong to apologize. Like this is great that more of this stuff exists. Keeps the content flowing. Yep. I, and honestly, I mean, like, man, like you honestly could make a legit case that Manos is the best episode of that show just because of how good the jokes in that are. Like, they like the in between segments, but when they're watching the movie, like. 
just how they are just suffering and getting progressively worse and worse as the movie goes on. And it, it's so bad yeah. that both Forrester and Frank apologize to Joel and the bots for making them watch it. Like, they're saying, like, like they're actually, like, how bad does a movie have to be to get Forrester and Frank to think they went too far? Extremely bad. <laughs> this... And keep in mind, they made him watch movies like... They made, they made him watch movies like uh, like Rocket Ship USA. Uh, what was that? What was the one that inspired the rock climbing? Lost Continent. That was it. Oh. Lost, <laughs> Lost Continent. They made him watch Lost Continent. They made him watch Hercules and the Moon Man. But Manos is where they actually apologize. Well, it is a very bad movie, and the ending is very sick, if you if you ask me. I mean, you'd expect it to be sick. It's a horror movie. But it's, I'm just gonna par- uh, I'm gonna pair yeah. what SF Debris though said about it that Manos looks like a movie that was made by someone who has no idea how movies were made. Yep. Oh, so that means it's one of the best movies ever, right? No. <laughs> No, like it has, like it is, like the footage looks, like the footage looks like something from the Zapruder film. The performances are about it. The performances and delivery are extremely wooden. Like the acting in the room is legitimately better. That's how bad it is. Apparently from some stories you can actually buy the Manos cloak. It's just it's such an awful production. Now, Manos may be the worst movie they ever covered, but believe me when I say this, that title does not go unchallenged, and the Coleman Francis movies they covered with Mike are really give it a run for its money. <laughs> had a budget of nineteen thousand dollars <laughs> i gotta okay i got give me a minute because like i gotta i think uh it was either bill or kevin one of them had a really brilliant quote about coleman francis's filmmaking style he only made three movies they're all terrible there's no start or end to any talent he is and it's almost like if he, if Colin Francis had actually had some modicum of talent, he could have been a, been a real avant-garde filmmaker, but he didn't, so his movies are just terrible. Probably Manos had a sequel. Yeah. Okay, so oh, here's... it came out in 2018. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, here's Kevin's quote on Colin Francis. Colin Francis uses edits like blunt instruments. He uses blunt instruments like blunt instruments. His major themes are death, hatefulness, death, pain, and death. He looks like Curly Howard possessed by demons from hell. He tries to pass off Lake Mead as the Caribbean Sea. His films have the moral compass of David Berkowitz. Is that all? That's all. There are also I, movies that they would never touch as well. Yeah, there was a one, yeah, there was one that was done with a whole bunch of I did, gotta say the gotta say the politically correct term. People of short stature, shall we say. I forget what it was called. Was it a terror tiny town? Oh no. I do know what you're talking about though, because I remember Cinema Snob doing an episode on it. Okay. That 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 that's a that's a man I miss watching all the time. I need to get back into Cinema Snob. Ben, do you remember what the name of that what the name of that movie was? Uh, well, now I said now I now that they said, which one? The one that they wouldn't touch. Well, they said they would would never name it, but since Cinema Snob did a review of it, it's called Child Bride. Well. Basically, the movie was a guest child marriage, and somehow 
managed to be so completely offensive that nobody would want to see the movie, even the ones who are against uh, child marriage. Uh. Boy, boy, was I completely wrong. It was not a movie about, about a, it was not a Western movie full of dwarves. Though that does sound like a movie they would have covered. Yeah. yeah. But, <clears throat> they, I have the types of movies that they said that they enjoy covering are the ones that are basically they have nonsensical stories. Mm-hmm. They cover, uh, they have the wrong characters to lead. Mm-hmm. The character will just fumble his way through and not really advance the plot in any way. Such as this island Earth. Mm-hmm. You have this character, uh, this lead character, Cal, who doesn't really do anything to advance the plot. He's just kind of there. They also they also kind of avoided doing going for easy targets like Ed Wood movies. Like they only ever touched one Ed Wood movie in the show's entire run. And that was just because by that point, like like everyone knew already knew about Ed Wood, so I guess so they just figured it's like, well what's the point? What well, everyone already knows what knows how it's going to be anyway. Yeah. Everyone knows it's going to suck. Yeah. Also, I don't know if I don't know if the Tim Burton movie on Ed Wood had anything to do with it, but I wouldn't be surprised. And I say that mostly yeah, because but... I th- and I say that mostly because I think the move the the Tim Burton movie kind of made people sort of reevaluate Ed Wood's reputation, thinking that like, <laughs> you know what, the guy wasn't good at what he did, but you know, but he enjoyed what he did. Yeah, if only more people were like that. Someone that they got a lot of mileage out of, out of taking the piss out of, though, was Sandy Frank. Yep. So Sandy Frank, what he he would import Japanese movies, and a lot of them real, really, really cheesy and dumb and stupid, and give them an English dub. Like if some English names, <laughs> yeah. Like he, had, like uh, let's see. Here's a. All right. Let let me pull. Let me do a quick look. Okay. So. Here are all here are all the movies that Sandy Frank had a hand in that MST3K covered. Crawling Head, Humanoid Woman, Mighty Jack, Untamed Youth. Gamera the Invincible, Star Force Fugitive Alien 2, Gamera, Crawling Eye, Legend of Dinosaurs and Monster Birds, Time of the Apes, and Fugitive Alien 1. They're all they're all bad. None That's of these a creeping good. eye. None of these are good movies. Just so you guys know. I mean they wouldn't be on MST3K if they were good. But for one, but Sandy Frank touched all of these and it got and they got so much mileage out of making fun of him that he took it kind of personally. There are a lot of those. Such as Joe Don Baker, they would not want to meet in a dark alley. They only did two of his movies. Yeah, but he's got that low, uh, that thin of skin. Yeah, I know, I know. They they did two of his movies. The There was Mitchell, which turned out to be Joel's last episode. And then there was Final Justice during Mike, like Sarah. Mm-hmm. Now compare that to Miles O'Keefe when they did Cave Dwellers. Like Miles O'Keefe was like he he actually laughed at it. Like he he actually got the joke. He he was flattered that they covered it, and he was so flattered. In fact, he actually asked them for a copy of that episode. Signed, even. So yeah, Miles O'Keefe, great guy. Joe Don Baker, not a great guy. Just a shame <laughs> Miles O'Keefe wasn't in a better movie. Yeah, I have a feeling that could be said about a lot of, a lot of actors, especially in this day and age. Yeah, 
Yeah, but n- yeah, but none of them are like none of them reach that same kind of kind of level of camp cheese. Is in just sheer ineptitude that you would see on MST3K. It's like nowadays you can predict how good a movie's going to be just based off the trailer alone, sort of. Pretty much. Unfortunately. So yeah, M- MST3K. It also kind of... The reason why I want to bring back up the behind-the-scenes drama regard- regarding the... Earning the Comedy Central seasons. This is very important because... Well, when Comedy Central first brought them on, they ne- they just needed anything to just fill in airspace. And so they gave them a two-hour block uh, to work with because, you know, hey, we don't have a ton of content. These guys have a show that brings in ratings. We'll just let them do whatever they want. But as the show went on and the cha- and the network evolved, all of a sudden that two-hour block became a problem. And not only that, Comedy Central was moving more into sort of the edgier content that it became known for. Yeah, at around that time, Comedy Central really wanted to be the the channel that, I, I, I guess for lack of a better way of phrasing it, Stand out compared to everybody else. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, gave us stuff like South Park, but yeah. also gave us a lot of things that didn't really last all too long and didn't leave much of a legacy. Yeah, no. I just want to know who thought it would be a good idea to green light Lil Bush. <laughs> 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 Is that going to be a if-you-know-you-know joke? You mean the animated show about a young George Bush in the White House? That only lasted in the last... Maybe it's about the last year of George W.'s first term. It it was was essentially them... It was like proto the... Was it the the Donald Trump cartoon one? Yeah. Yeah, it's sort of like the time before that. It was... I don't know, I really don't think it was... Like, I don't even like George Bush that much, but it wasn't really that good. And there's a, or that show that makes fun of the British royal family. Yeah. Uh, well, the thing about Will Bush was that they had to rely on a lot of things that John Stewart made, I had done better. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, so yeah, like, Comedy Central was kind of changing what they wanted to do as a network, and MST3K wasn't fitting into that vision less, more and more as it went on. And that was also partly why they kind of futzed with it behind the scenes. They tried to work around this as best they could, but eventually... Eventually, of course, the network suits decided to just us ax it. Uh, it was around, I believe, what was it, season six or seven, Matt? Yeah, season seven. Yeah. Now they did. Ev- they did kind of give themselves one hell of a send off. Now, because it's like the the final segment of the final Comedy Central episode is them just doing a parody of two thousand one, a space oddity. How to see? You mean? How to see? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I guess I can see that being a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like. Well. And as Mike and the bots turn into pure energy, and then Doctor Forster becoming a star baby. It's great stuff. And also, uh, Mike got to cosplay as his favorite captain. You <laughs> got to beat Janeway. <laughs> <laughs> like it's 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 good stuff, and you know, like they went out with a bang. But thankfully, the fans were so diehard and loyal. Like they managed a grassroots campaign to get it revived, and they brought it over to Sci-Fi, which gave the show another three seasons of life. Sadly, the last season was kind of tr- was truncated. They only got like thirteen of po- opposed to like their usual. I think like what twenty three or something. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, they... it also had its moments, such as when Joel came back yes, for an episode. Soul Taker, I love that episode. And it's for the Joel bits. They also kind of ran into a lot of the same hurdles that over at Sci-Fi that they did with Comedy Central. Like, Sci-Fi wanted one thing. Show wasn't that thing. But... I think the biggest, biggest thing, the, the biggest albatross that sci-fi put around MST3K's neck was they wanted they wanted them to do something to increase ratings because while the ratings were steady, like a lot of people in a lot of people in the TV industry, they look at a lack of growth as a sign of something being wrong. And so they would meet with the writing staff and say, well, make it edgier or something. And then they would ask, well, what do you mean make it edgier? And they couldn't come up with a good answer. So and they were just kind of left to just work on, on it themselves. The, yeah, welcome to the networks. <laughs> yeah, network politics, they are not fun. But, you know, like, a, you know, like Matt said, there were still some good things in the sci-fi era. They still managed to get some good... Yep. And this was something we kind of glossed over, but, like, over the show's lifetime, like, it wasn't just Joel who, Joel who left. Like, they also eventually lost Frank, I think, around... It would be season six, I think. Season six, yep. Yep. Basically, they lost Frank... Gained Dr. Forrester's mother. Yeah, Pearl. And then, like, near the. And, like, uh, Trace, be Trace Below. Uh, below, I forget how his name is pronounced. The guy who does Dr. Forrester and the original voice for Crow, he didn't come back after season seven, so they upgraded Mary Jo Peel, who does Pearl, to the main antagonist, and she took over. And because Trace had left, that meant they had to find someone to replace him to voice Crow, and that's where Bill Corbett enters. And not only that, Bill and Kevin also had to pull double duty being Pearl's sidekicks. Yeah, that was actually pretty funny. Due to how different the two are. Yeah. Uh, th yeah, the thing that uh, Bill kind of struggled with initially doing doing Crow was that when he started out, he was basically doing an impression of how Trace did it, but as it went on, he kind of started making Crow more his character. Duran found his own voice for it. Crow became more aggressive in this in this, those seasons. <laughs> he had less patience for the movie. <laughs> oh, yeah, another thing that is worth bringing up is that they were initially trepidatious about upgrading Mary Jo to take over. Because, well, let's just say Mary Mary Jo is Mary Jo is a person of size. Her words, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> and so there was some concern about making a person of size the antagonist, but. Mary Jo just ran with it, and they just dis and they eventually just say, you know, fuck it, we'll just do this, and whatever happens, happens. Really, you couldn't just tell her that she couldn't be the villain based on her size, because she was very good at it. I know, I know, and it's like, you know, let me put it this way, if there was any controversy about having a person of size as the main antagonist for the show, I don't think anyone heard about it. As far as I know. She had that kind of charisma to be a villain. Yeah. Especially when he, she had to... Had a talking ape and a guy with a brain in a pan as her henchman. Yeah, to put... To, uh, again, borrow another quote from SF Debris, she is the Mo in this, in this band of stooges. Yeah, once they eventually got to the end of the of the sci-fi run, like they kind of they kind of resigned themselves to that this was going to be it for MST three K because they just could not fathom that there was going to be another way that they were going to be able to get the show back on the air. So 
they really kind of put a lot of finality into that final episode. Satellite of Love finally comes down to Earth. And Mike, Kevin, and Mike, Tom, and, and Crow are hanging out at his apartment. And then, I assume, Minnesota. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and they're watching The Crawling Eye on TV. The first MST3K episode. Yeah. Unfortunately, they lost the rights for the final episode because of the movie. Yeah, I you know they did, but I, like I said, I so, SF Debris brought this up in his retrospective that they eventually did manage to get it back in there, and so uh, I think it's called Diavolo or something. It got a yeah Diabolic. I think it's Diabolic. Yeah, Diabolic. Diabolic. Yeah, they got a home release for it. Like you were actually able to buy it on. I had on physical media. Which is good. Yeah, and something I would probably be remiss is like not discussing the circumstances which led to Joel's departure from the show. Which this is kinda hard to get a definitive answer on because they're all very they're all kinda hush hush on the subject. Not because it's bad or anything, but because they just kinda had an unspoken agreement that they would keep the bad blood behind closed doors. You know, be professional. Yeah, like like I You're said, not, isn't it? <laughs> can you tell these guys are not in the Hollywood system? <laughs> yeah. So, allegedly, the show's I, producer, I can... the show's producer Jim, it was Jim Mallon, right? Yep. The yes. show's producer Jim Mallon. He was starting to ex he was starting to kind of exert more control over the brand of MST3K. It could basically come down to creative differences. He had one idea for what it should be, and the creative staff known as the brains, they had another idea. And not only that, he also kind of leveraged the con Jim leveraged the control he had over the sh over the brand. That meant that any ideas they came up with were going to be owned by the production company they started up to make MST3K. And so it sort of it ended up making, making this a creatively stifling environment to work in. Yeah, that's how it usually goes. And but it actually did try to do more MST3K after the show ended. They tried doing a... Flash animation series starring the robots, but without any other voice actors. Yeah, it sucks. I'll just say that right out. It, it, if you go looking out for that Flash animation, it, it, it just sucks. Like, it's not funny at all. And like I said, because of this friction that was, that was uh, brewing between Jim and the brains, like, this was... This was kind of becoming harder on Joel because he was being pushed, because Jim was kind of pushing him really to be, I think, the face of the show, and it was a position Joel just wasn't comfortable with. He never did want to be the host. <laughs> it's actually funny, but you know who he did want to be the host? Was it Mike? No, Jerry Seinfeld. Jerry Seinfeld. Yes. There is an alternate reality where Jerry Seinfeld is the host of MST3K, people. Let that sink in. <laughs> what's the and Seinfeld told what's the deal with the deal with this eye why is it crawling well aside from the fact that Seinfeld didn't think that was more it was part of his style but also he told Joel to host himself because it was his thing I mean ultimately that was the right decision because honestly, like I, I cannot imagine that show having the same identity with Seinfeld held instead of Joel. Yeah, I I do think it's funny that there would there was a time there's an alternate reality where Seinfeld didn't become popular because of his own show. He became popular because of MST3K. Yeah, like I said that. That that timeline, the idea for that timeline is funny on its own, but yeah, like, what we got was definitely the right choice.
But yeah, I think where this, I think where the friction really became untenable though was when they started trying to work on an MST3K movie. Like, yeah, Joel did not like the idea. Well, not only that, it really started from what from what I understand, it became less about the brains making their movie and and more about making Jim's movie. Yeah, and boy, was was that rough. The movie itself is good, but hearing about the production stories, about the kind of hell they had to go through the studio and all that, there was not. It was a nightmare on the production end. Mm-hmm. Oh, I can I can believe it. Like I'm very intimately familiar with the hell that Warner Herzog put up making Fitz Corraldo. There's a whole documentary on how nightmarish a production Apocalypse Now was, I can buy that this was bad, too. Yeah. Yeah. Man. <laughs> but, yeah, like, let's just say there's, if you go from the from the classic series to the Netflix show, you'll notice something. Gypsy has a different voice in both. That's because Jim didn't yeah. come back. I think anyone who was familiar with the show in the 90s would have noticed immediately. Which would have been most of the people who watched the Netflix revival. Like, I cannot imagine most millennials and millennials and Zoomers having having any interest in it. Present company excluded Dusk. I I think millennials were a big part of it, actually, because of the time that was made in. I don't really do Netflix, so... Yeah, but I, I don't know, like, something like... Something like that, it just really seems like it has more appeal to Gen Xers. I mean, I didn't kind of see it, I guess. The problem, I would say, with the Netflix series is that it looks a little too good. They also have a lot of celebrity guests as well. Yeah, it's also that. <laughs> yeah, Felicia Day and Patton Oswalt. Like, mm. Not just that, it's, there's also... It gets very... Distracting when Mark Hamill shows up out of nowhere. Uh, look, the appeal. Wait, what? Yeah, yeah, you heard that. <laughs> what? Look, the yeah, appeal, Mark Hamill. The appeal. Yeah, yeah, it was a cameo. The appeal of MST3K was that it was made outside the Hollywood system. We did not need our celebrity nerds like Patton Oswalt and Felicia Day. Hey, getting their fingers on it. I don't care if they like this. Sh- I don't care if they really like the show. It's just- to be honest. I think they fit the characters pretty well. Yeah. It's just that it when you get someone like Mark Hamill, or if you get Dan Harmon writing an episode, then I think all magic is kind of well goes away. Yeah, like. Yeah, like I said, this thing not being part of Hollywood was what made it special. Now you well, it's also it, the cheap sets. Yeah, like I said, yeah. Like them upping the production value, bringing in Hollywood people. Like, that's just... Now it just feels more corporate and processed. Yeah, well now... They're completely independent. Yes. Yeah, the... Uh, yeah, we brought this up in the last in the last episode that they ran that they ran a Kickstarter about a year or two ago that was very successful, and they're working on producing more mystery science theater, completely free of any Hollywood interference too. Mm. I my biggest problem with the Netflix show were pretty much the riffs. Mm-hmm. They were. It felt like Netflix had a lot more of a hand in the jokes. And you'd figure it's... The problem, my problem would be that it sounds too sanitary. It's more along the lines of... It's the opposite problem, actually. Yeah, they... They made them too mean. Period. Which is saying something considering this is the same show that got mileage out of rubbishing Sandy Frank and doing a, an especially mean skit making fun of Orville Redenbacher. They did get mean with those things, but 
they didn't say anything along the lines of shooting someone. <laughs> By the way, I gotta show you, oh, you yeah, this, you yeah, this bit dusk. Oh god, oh, oh red Walker. Horrible Ren Walker has good popcorn though. No. Uh, it's so good. Boy, Gramp, I sure am enjoying this Godzilla movie, and hey, I sure enjoy being your grandson. Ah, keep talking, buddy. You know, I certainly have a master fortune donning dorky bow ties, weaselly glasses, and big boy styled haircuts. <laughs> yeah, sure, whatever you say, Gramp. <laughs> you know, Gramp, I was looking through some Italian fashion portfolios. This is based off a real ad they did back you know, in the maybe day. Maybe we could hire a fashion consultant. Shut up, a... you little cretin. It's my fortune, and I'll decide how we wear our hair. <laughs> but, but, Gramps, what good is having a bazillion dollar popcorn empire if no sweet chick will breed with me? Listen to yourself, buddy. Oh. It's part of the proud popcorn creed to be without the love of a woman. Uh, we can concentrate <laughs> on genetically improving our popcorn if we have extremely abundant members of the weaker sex parading <laughs> up and down the rows of our high-yield super chief double whammy ganga ganga corn. Sweet fruit juices anointing <laughs> their bodies. Come on, how would that look? Well, I still want one. Oh, buddy, get a hold of yourself, man. We're scientists. Yeah, sorry, Gramps. Hey, can I ask you a question? Of course. When will you be dying, you twisted old ferret? <laughs> <laughs> I'm your grandfather. I you told you it was me. We're popcorn. I'm sorry, Gramps, but I can't stop thinking of all that money. I'm really looking forward to the day when you shed your spotty, pockmarked mortal coil. I shed my geeky image, sign on a full-time hairstylist, take dance lessons, and disappear into the night. <laughs> buddy, you're going to disappear into the night right now if you don't shut up. Don't think I I haven't thought of disowning you. I relish the thought. Nightly, nightly, do you hear me? Nightly! Uh, did I mention the fact that our new light has one-third the calories of our regular popcorn? What do you care? You can't afford it? You're flat busted. But our new popcorn oh. gratin has real cheese flavor. Good, you should get used to it. You're gonna be eating a real lot of cheese. cheese. Government cheese. Oh, why do you always do this? I hate you! I've always hated you! What happened to my real father anyway? He's in that poorhouse where I replace him just like I'm going to replace you if you don't oh. shut up and do as I say. It's my will, my will, not yours! I've got the keys to the kingdom. I, me, mine, I'm the god! I'm the god! I hate you! I hate you! I hate you. Right. Right. <laughs> Can we cut again? Okay, listen, what we're going to need, is, it's a 30-second spot, and uh, try to mention the product more. We also got uh, okay. commercial showing here, okay? <laughs> it's, isn't that great? <laughs> yeah. Okay, it's so, just like I'm going to go completely off the, off the cuff. Yeah. If and, it, there's one thing uh, I noticed wait. about... Joel air uh, about Joel is that if he get if he's fed up with a movie, the Minnesota accent just comes out completely. The Minnesota accent. Yep. It gets thicker and thicker. Now we just saw they were pretty mean in that in that skit, and the jokes they were writing for Netflix were somehow meaner than this. <laughs> well, it's for the most part with the uh, if all the riffs in the movies. They were actually uh, being pretty mean to the actors in the jokes. Like compared to that skit we just watched. Yeah. <laughs> the thing about that skit is that it's all been uh, Crow and Tom Serval's personalities. So, so that'd be pretty mean. And also, nobody in their right mind would think Orville Rettenbacher was actually like this. No. <laughs> like, it's funny because it's just so absurd. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> it just kept escalating and escalating. Which the robots were known to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one, of the, one of the best opening bits is... It says that Crow and Crow and Tom decide to run away and live on the other side of the satellite. Uh, Joel and Joel and Gypsy just tell just tell them bye. I hope you make it. And it doesn't even take them five minutes before they start arguing, and then Crow hits Tom, and Tom is crying. <laughs> and then they come back. Crow and Tom, they were like two bickering brothers. Well, you'd have to say that's probably the thing they're going for because you can also tell that there's a big difference in how they treated 
Mike and compare it to Joel. Yeah, Mike said, yeah, the way Mike put it is that he's like, he's like the young, young assistant manager at a restaurant. Like, you know, he's supposed to technically be in charge. He's supposed to set an example, but he's more, lo- more likely to get involved in shenanigans. One thing I did think was that Netflix did right was with the uh, stream Crow and Tom Servo had to promote the show. Mm-hmm. And they refer to Joel as being like their father, mm-hmm. Mike as the older brother that they can get along with, mm-hmm. and Jonah as the podcast host they can turn off when they felt like it. <laughs> God, now that is mean. And amazingly, Jonah's still hosting. Yeah. Which means that the robots actually do like him. In fairness, yeah. Like, I, everyone should know better than to take anything Crow and Tom say as indicative of what the actual staff feels. They're just jokes. Yeah. Guys. Or even Crow and Tom Servo. They're just puppets making jokes, guys. Don't take it that seriously. All right, so we're nearing the end of the show, and I think this is a good time for Matt and I to discuss what our favorite episodes are of the show are, and, you know, hopefully, Dusk, you're going to hear something that might catch your interest. All right, so hear it. All right, Matt, start off. I think that... What? Well, I've got... There's so many of them, actually. <laughs> well, if I were to say uh, make a definitive one based on how good it was. I think it was the episode Death Ray where Tom Servo builds a Death Ray in one of those skits. You know, for per- peaceful purposes, as you will. Yeah. Peaceful. peaceful. And he intended it for peaceful purposes until he saw Crow walk, up, walk along and fire, up, fire at him. <laughs> well... <laughs> His immediate pilot response. Is that Joel yeah. or is this uh, Joel or Mike? It's yeah. a Mike episode and oh, Mike. what happens is that they hit, uh, they think of the crow puppet pretty badly. Uh, and had a small spark of fire on there. Mm-hmm. Well that fire unexpectedly grew bigger. And Trace did not break character. <laughs> So then you hear basically it's Crow yelling in pain as they go to a commercial break. <laughs> Which one's that one again? I think the episode's called Death Ray. Just Death Ray? I'll look it up. But it's definitely one of the ones I recommend. One of my favorite episodes has to be Hercules and the Moon Men. And this is because Forrester and Frank have one of the best opening bits where they threaten Joel and the bots with something being far worse than and more boring than Lost Continent and rock climbing. Sandstorm leading to deep hurting... Deep hurting. And once the sandstorm sets in the movie, like, it's just minutes of nothing happening. And Crow and Tom slowly losing their minds and Joel doing everything he can to keep them sane. And trying to comfort them as they suffer through one of the most boring segments of any movie they've seen. And also, it's got some real... It's a really campy Hercules movie, so it's got that going. Uh, uh, well, to ask your question, Duskwell, earlier, mm. it's called Danger Death Ray. It's in the sixth season. Oh. All right. Now, what were you going to say? It's, uh, just out of morbid curiosity, I did a search about this Hercules... Is Hercules against the Moon Men? And yeah, that's quite the synopsis. Like I said, it's it's a cheesy Hercules movie. So there's also where he fights aliens from the moon. Yeah, 
Uh, you got another one, Matt? Well, I definitely say Space Mutiny. Oh, God, that one's awesome. It's another Mike one. It's basically, it basically stars the guy who played Captain America in the early, I think it was the, it, it was the 80s Captain America movie where he wasn't, he was actually just a cop. It was a TV movie starring Red Brown. Yep, and, uh, and at random moments, they'll just make up new names for the main character, such as Beef Slash Lot. Big. McGuire's huge. It was also a very bad movie that used the models, I uh, used scenes from the original Battlestar Galactica series. It also really did not make sense at all, like the world building. It's about a generational economy ship, but for some reason, there's also inhabited human systems in the area as well. I say, I definitely say watch, watch it dusk. I all realize why they had to do it again for Rift Tricks. Another one that I also highly recommend, another Joel episode, Cave Dwellers. I get that one. Sounds interesting. It is... Think of the cheapest possible Conan knockoff, and you're halfway there. And somehow he has the ability to make a hang glider. <laughs> oh, what? what? Yeah, so during the ending, uh, before he, uh, when he breaks into the his enemy's castle, he makes a hang glider and glides in. Yeah, and out of the skin of a dead and monster or something. I can't remember if it was a bat, a giant bat, pterodactyl, or dragon. I don't remember. It was... Uh, it looks like a deer. It was made from a deer. <laughs> it's a deer. <laughs> it's... Yeah, like I said, it, and not only that, like, the opening credits to that are, like, it's a trip because it's using footage from a completely different movie. And well, that then. wasn't the first time it's happened, either. Hot people... Yeah, that yeah, that one's an ET knockoff. And I ex and the the footage I Rift Tracks actually did the movie that originally had that footage. And let me tell you something, that's also very bad. Now I got one from Mike's era that I'm very fond of. And that would be Soul Taker. Soul Taker Stars Martin Sheen's brother as some kind of grim raper figure who goes around taking people's souls, and a bunch of kids get in a car accident and they're ghosts and they're being stalked by this guy. Like a, the the concept sounds cool on paper, but it's just it's got some really cheap special effects and it's really worth it just to see Joel come back and Frank. And sort of, it's sort of Frank, like a, it is. yeah. Frank's a soul taker in it. Yep. Another Mike episode that I'm fond of is Werewolf, which again also has Martin Sheen's brother in it. it. Has some of the worst werewolf special effects you'll see in any movie. It is so bad that Mike later was quoted saying that the movie was a gift from God. <laughs> Holy shit! Oh, so that good, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, I just did not realize something. Yes. Rift Tracks has done now done more movies than MST3K has episodes. Well, they they expanded the scope to just any movie in general, not just bad movies. I think they're also including, uh, they're just including the bad movies. Because yeah. there's a lot of stinkers that they did. Uh, yeah, I know, but it's like, from what I understand, like, they'll just, they'll put any movie on Rift Tracks. Like, doesn't matter if it's good or bad. Well, well, that's true, but <laughs> well, I think when they say that they got more episodes, 
I think they're referring to the ones that they can that they're legally able to sell without the uh, sell as both the movie and the riffs. Yeah, because like most of the time, all you can do is just all you can do is just get the commentary track. Yep. Yeah, I think I remember like one time like we uh, we watched the riff tracks episode for Reefer Madness. for madness. Yeah, Dusk knows what we're talking about. <laughs> Wait, did they actually did an episode on that on that one? Yeah, they did. Uh, MST 3K, no, but Rift Tracks, they did. <laughs> oh yeah, Rift Tracks. Yeah. And basically, Rift Tracks is the sci-fi channel era. It's just it's just Mike, Kevin, and Bill without the puppets or sets. Which they actually they do have chemistry. They're very good, to, uh, good together. Oh, yeah. yeah, in fact, like uh, they ended, you know, like uh, they tried doing a doing a similar show to Rift Tracks called Film Crew. That didn't that didn't end up, end up taking off because of <clears throat> Jim. Yeah, he didn't want South Factory to produce competition. Like, I don't know, like, did he try, like, pulling, like, some kind of copyright shit, shit or something? Because, like... Or, could... it's more... Well, since it's South, South Factory that did it, he told South Factory that if they didn't put an end to it, then he'd pull the rights for MST3K. Yeah, the reason... Think... Yeah, folks, the reason why Jim could pull this shit off was because he managed the business side of, side of MST3K. Let this be a lesson to you. Be very careful who you trust with your business. Uh, yeah, at first, I don't think they had much of a problem since Kevin Murphy and Jim were friends yeah. at the time. History has shown how that's ended. Yeah. Okay, so we're nearing the end of the show, and like I said, just so we can leave you on a, on a more positive note, like, if you can... You can hunt down most of the MST3K episodes onto the light YouTube search. It's uh, You'll either find them through Shout Factor's YouTube channel, MST3K's YouTube channel, or just the odd episode some random person has uploaded. Like, it, this stuff isn't hard to find. And Or you could sign up for, uh, you could get the MST3K app and sign up for an account with them. You get the seasons up, to, uh, all the Comedy Central and Sci-Fi episodes for free. Mm -hmm. I literally just typed uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000 on YouTube and it came up with a Mystery Science Theater 3000 YouTube channel with 194,000 subscribers and last video they uploaded was like six days ago, mm -hmm. which was which has a season 13 episode. Mm -hmm. well, a, well, a clip from season 13. Yep. And if yeah, and uh, they will be doing their their annual Turkey Day marathon this Thanksgiving, which will which at the time we are recording this will be yesterday. Well, yeah, specifically Thursday the twenty third. This thing's going up on Friday the twenty fourth. Yeah. Oh, apparently the uh, that same channel also does live streams where it's actually watch alongs. Yep. Yeah, I guess. The, like I said, it's not, like I said, finding the content, it's not hard. I mean, like, do yourself, do guys, just do yourself a favor. If you haven't, give it, a, give the show a shot. Like, and kind of, like, there is so much of the modern internet that kind of owes itself to MST3K because there were a lot of people from Channel Awesome who were heavily influenced by this show. And not only that, like, just kind of the whole idea of just, Having fun, like having fun with the criticism and just pointing it and just laughing at a movie or another piece of media just being bad, like that all traces its roots back to MST3K. We wouldn't have, let me put it this way there's probably a case to be made that we would not have the angry video game nerd without MS, without Mystery Science Theater 3000. Uh, it's definitely one of those. Cultural focal points when it comes to the internet and how 
a, a lot of reviews or reactionary content is done. Mm -hmm. Like the like the really good ones. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, just so yeah, give it, so yeah. The if I got any final thoughts to say aside from you know, leave a like, comment, subscribe. Get up on the Mythoverse Patreon if you can. Other than that, like I said, just my final thoughts are just give the Mystery Science Theater a watch, guys. Matt, Dusk, you guys, what do you guys have? I also say watch Rift Tracks simply for the fact that if you like the sci-fi channel era, you'll definitely get a kick out of watching it. Mm. Don't have too much to say myself outside of um, if there was ever any really bad movies that you ever want to watch but can't really get one to watch them with you because watching bad movies can be a bit of a chore on your own but you know be good for a laugh. Mystery Science Theater 3000 and stuff along the similar vein is a great way of going about watching them because... It, you'll definitely at least feel like you're watching them with someone else, and it just adds another layer to comedy when a, when a professional comedian is the one mm -hmm. making fun of the bad movies for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really does. So, I guess we would normally we would probably would close this out by saying Happy Thanksgiving, but we recorded. We recorded this on Sunday, uploaded this on a Friday, so we'll just say we hope you guys had a good Thanksgiving, at least. And other than that, we'll see you guys next week. Another Radio Mythoverse, or maybe another Mytho Gaming. Who knows? We don't, and that's part of the fun. Yeah, uh, yeah, all by ourselves. <laughs> Not very mysterious anyway whatsoever. Not foreboding at all. <laughs>